Bonjour tout le monde. Euh, premièrement, je souhaitais remercier les gens présents dans la salle. Vraiment, euh, c'est euh, presque émotif de, de voir, <rire> d'être devant un, un auditoire réel et non pas seulement que virtuel. Mais aussi, euh, bonjour aux, aux gens euh, qui sont euh, branchés peut-être euh, du côté de l'Europe. Donc, on tient à vous dire un, un bonjour et à vous remercier d'être présents tous euh, ce midi. Euh, donc, je me nomme premièrement Nathalie Pellerin, je suis la directrice adjointe aux études qui est responsable, entre autres, du programme d'orthèse visuelle. Et puis, euh, je suis très fière aujourd'hui euh, de me trouver devant vous le département d'orthèse visuelle. C'est un département qui est très créatif et dynamique. Et euh, de concert avec la mobilité étudiante, euh, il y avait quand même des projets de mobilité qui étaient en cours avant cette pandémie-là. Et euh, ben, non, le département s'est relevé les manches et a décidé de faire vivre la mobilité euh, autrement. Donc, euh, c'est euh, super intéressant. Et euh, c'est aussi donné comme mission de nous faire euh, voyager en mars, donc au mois de mars. <rire> euh, cette année, mars est officiellement ici au collège, le mois du design. Donc, c'est avec plaisir qu'on vous accueille à notre première euh, activité pour ce mois du design. Nous voyagerons géographiquement puisque nous aurons l'occasion de faire une escapade virtuelle dans trois pays différents, chacun d'eux révélant un éminent créateur ou créatrice de monture. Aujourd'hui, les États-Unis, la semaine prochaine, la France et l'Italie pour la semaine du 31 mars. Mais au-delà des frontières, nous voyagerons également dans l'imagination et le cœur de ces créateurs. Vous pourrez faire la découverte de personnalités inspirantes qui vous feront voir les montures d'un tout autre œil. De leur tête à vos mains, vous connaîtrez l'art de la monture. Vos connaissances acquises en classe seront mises en contexte sous un angle nouveau. Et je ne parle pas ici d'angle d'incidence, de chasse ou pantoscopique. Demandez-moi pas d'expliquer ce bout-là, je ne pourrais pas vous l'expliquer. <rire> euh, et qui sait, ce voyage en sera possiblement un vers le futur parce que vous découvrirez peut-être votre propre ambition, un rêve d'avenir qui vous était jusqu'alors inconnu. Notre mois du design débute donc avec une conférence vous présentant Mme Gaille Gérardi, opticienne et cofondatrice de LEI Works, entreprise de Los Angeles, fondée en 1979. Avec plus de 40 années d'expérience, cette opticienne à la créativité intuitive et audacieuse vous parlera de son parcours coloré et de sa façon de voir le monde lunettier. Elle vient d'ailleurs tout juste de recevoir un prix de l'Optical Women's un peu, je vois plus, Association qui a reconnu son rôle exceptionnel dans l'avancement du leadership féminin dans l'industrie de l'optique. Et en cette semaine euh, qui débutait avec la journée de la femme, bien, je pense que c'est tout à fait approprié de recevoir cette personne en entrevue. L'entretien a été pris, enregistré et durera 50 minutes. Je tenais à remercier Sophie Bellavance, professeure au département d'orthèse visuelle, pour la traduction de l'entrevue. Euh, ce, cet entretien de, avec Mme Girardi sera euh, fait ou euh, mené de main de maître, j'en suis certaine, j'ai hâte de voir le début, euh, par Noam, Naomi Adida, étudiante de troisième année en technique d'orthèse visuelle et gagnante du concours de conception de monture édition 2018. Naomi sera aussi disponible à la fin euh, de la diffusion euh, de l'entrevue pour des questions sur son expérience d'entretien avec Mme Girardi. Alors, je vous laisse à l'entrevue et je vous remercie encore une fois de votre présence. C'est très précieux pour nous de voir qu'on est encouragé dans les initiatives du département et du programme d'orthèse. Merci. I wanted to first off thank you so, so much for coming and talking with me today. Um, and thank you to your staff and your, in your office as well. You are in your office at the moment. So there are a lot of people working uh, for the LA Iwerks brand at the moment. So we really thank you so much for coming uh, to the Cégep Edouard Montpetit's uh, Opticianry Programs um, Design Month. So thank you so much for coming to talk to us. Um, I thank wanted you, Noya. It's my pleasure. Uh, I wanted to maybe give a first a little taste of who you are and what you do. Um, maybe some of our students here might not know too much about LA Iwerks or you specifically. So I was hoping if you could just give us like a first little rundown of Gay Girardi 
and who you are and what you do at LEI Works. Okay. So, um, well, thank, well, thank you again. Thank you. And thank all of you for um, having us. We're, we're very happy to be here with you today. Um, so, you know, my very best friend from high school, Barbara McReynolds, um, I have to credit her completely uh, with a foray into the optical industry in that she had a, she took a summer job uh, in the 60s uh, in an optical shop. And she called me within a day or two and said, hey, gay, I've got the coolest gig in the world and it's gonna, you're know, going to love it. And, um, and I thought it was funny because, uh, well, there was irony for me because Barbara had absentmindedly bumped into um, a sliding glass door about, about the week before. And it, it didn't hurt her, but it was just, it was like something that didn't happen often. And I thought, my God, you know, cause I was, I was relating it with glasses and not seeing and glass. And, and I just thought there was high irony in it anyway. Um, so I went for a job interview uh, because we, we wanted to make a, a, a trip, a, a hitchhiking trip out actually, if you will. And we thought, okay, it's good, cool summer job. We'll do this and then we'll go. Um, so I went for my interview, had a great, uh, got a job, um, right? And uh, the gentleman who owned the store became really a mentor to us. He, within the first couple of days, he taught us how to decenter a lens, how to take facial measurements, um, you know, and of course, this is crash course, and it all sounds hilarious, but, you know, and then he left us. And um, to, he put me in one store and Barbara in another store, and that was the beginning. So you know, um, and that, that is that is the beginning. So Barbara and I worked for um, uh, this gentleman named Mr. Rose uh, for s several years. Never, but in the beginning, we worked for him for two months. Then we left on our journeys uh, while we were away. He wrote us letters saying, you know, I don't know what you're doing. But when you want, you know, if you ever come back, uh, there's a job here for you. And, um, and that's really, uh, you know, what we were doing uh, was building his business in a, in a way that, you know, was true to us. Um, and that is that we were holding draft resistance meetings in his stores. Um, we were making, we were speaking about, um, we were using uh, uh, eyewear as, um, no, I don't know, I'll say as a resistance. Uh, at that time, we were able to make a very thick lens and take someone out of the draft for example, uh, with a plus or minus 14 lens, you could make them feel very nauseous. Um, and at that time, we knew just how many people we could, um, you know, keep out. And, uh, and, and then, you know, or they were going to go to Canada. <laughs> so, mm, yeah. <laughs> so this was a beginning for us. And I always talk about it because it was so meaningful. And, um, and that's, that, that was the beginning. Uh, when we came back, uh, we, uh, you know, we did go back to work with Mr. Rose and he mentored us, um, you know, in all ways uh, in that time. He says, you know, he would always say to us, look, I know this is not what you think you're going to do for the rest of your life, but let's do this. How about if you become licensed? How about if you work towards this? How about, and we would just go along with it because he was our employee. We re respected him and we were finding the joy from our side, you know, with other aspects of the business. So, you know, when that's, that's how it began. Um, well, that? yeah, no, that's wonderful. I, I love hearing that story. Um, my, so my question for you and that is like, what was, what, of course you guys loved it. You guys went back um, to Ed Rose after your, your hitchhiking trip, but what was it that like brought you back to the shop? What was it that really connected you to opticianry? Was it like the connection or, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, yes, it was the connect. It was really, there were so many things. But the first thing was, is that the very first time that I put a pair of glasses on someone, you know, and there was just a connection. You went towards them, looking them in the face, you touched their head, and you were looking them in the eyes. And there was something, I just can't tell you, that was so, you know, magical is the word overused, but it was a very deep, connection and if you're a person who likes people or loves the that connection that was a that was a an, an incredible spark and it was that for both Barbara and I so yes there so it was deeply and 
absolutely profoundly that moment of like going like that, having someone's head in your hands and looking them in the eyes is marvelous. And so along with all the other things that came with it, I mean, both Barbara and I were makers, you know, uh, we could, you know, fixing something, uh, you know, putting a screw in, repairing something, looking at something completely bent up and bringing it back to life. There, you know, the t- the, at the time, you know, uh, the the lab work, Barbara was completely into the lab work. I was less just because I didn't have access to it. But everything about it was fascinating. So it was just it was just one of those, you know, multi-layered, you know, beautiful uh, connections. That that yeah, I understand that that connection, that feeling. And I I figured as much that it would be about the connection with the clients, but also the the tinkering and the fact that you said that you're a maker I think really rings a bell to me because a lot of uh, opticians that I know and that I love are all makers of of things or tinkerers uh, as such. So I think it's really, really interesting um, that you became who you are today as this great designer of eyewear. And I know that um, Barbara and you ended up opening your own store in 1979. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we uh, we continued on the path of of you know working for others and saved our you know saved our dough and uh, opened a store on Melrose in 1979. Um, yeah, with the idea of you mm. know changing the face of LA. <laughs> right. That, yeah. That was our lo- That was our lofty notion. And what were you like? What were you hoping for with the flagship store on Melrose? Because I know I that, really want- yeah. Oh, go ahead. No, well, I know that, well, I've read that it kind of became a community spot and that um, it kind of had like a revolving door of artists and, and people uh, coming through. I mean, you can talk more about the space in itself, where it was located at the time. I know it was a little bit, uh, you know, not necessarily like the shopping street that it is today. Um, but yeah, what were you hoping for with the opening of the flagship? Yeah, well, you know, we want what we wanted, what we thought we we just couldn't wait to recontextualize the way that eyewear was presented, perceived. Um, and so that our goal really was, you know, then a million years ago was, you know, we wanted it to be like an art gallery. It sounds so trite now, but that's what we wanted. And the first things that we want, you know, so it was then about the space. It was about having clear, you know, it was making space. It was about the negative space between glasses. You know, it was about the repetition of something that was the same uh, and the space between it. So if you had, you know, collections of eyewear and there were five colors, then we wanted to see those five colors all together or seven colors or 10 colors. And we wanted to see the equal space between them. This, these things we obsessed on at the time, like, okay, don't put this here and don't have, there can be nothing interrupting that, the purity of that, because we wanted to share that feeling of when you really started to look at these objects, how incredibly um, you know, beautiful they could be. So, you know, that was really it. So we wanted the light to be natural. We wanted to be, um, we wanted the light to be natural. We wanted the space between the eyewear to show. We wanted no clutter whatsoever. And we wanted to literally frame glasses. You know, we didn't, we, we would have them sitting up. Now all these things are, you know, you just take them for granted. But at that time, to put a, a, an eyeglass frame up on its end, you know, so that it was going parallel, like, you know, standing up, was just something people didn't do. And so, you know, so, and people were at first afraid to touch everything because it was so like that. And it's so, that was part of it also, as we, we juxtaposed that, where we wanted you to touch everything, but we wanted you to see it. Right. We wanted you to see it, like see the space, see the colors, and, and that was really important to us. We also wanted you to see it, and we thought that that was our, per, our, our we wanted to share our perspective. Mm. And so in sharing that perspective, we, it also, as you mentioned, Naomi, it did, our shop became a hub. I can't say that was an expectation. That was a gift. 
Um, and that was that, you know, because really we didn't, you know, we can say all these things. We knew what we wanted to do, but we were flying by the seat of our pants. It wasn't like a goal kind of oriented where it had to accomplish this by this, by this, by then. Um, what we, so, you know, as, and I've said this with you before, I think is that Barbara said, look, if we, uh, if, if, if people like what we do, then we can open our door tomorrow. And really that, that was, that was our goal, you know, is that we would have enough people who liked what we do that we could open our door again tomorrow. Right. And so, yeah, that's it. Um, and also I will say in the beginning, right away, we, um, because of the city we live in and we, we, and because of who we were attracting and who we were speaking to and what the community that was, we were accessing, um, Right away, we started. We used our show, our store as um, as a gallery. We had we had gallery shows, seriously curated shows, uh, every five weeks in the store. Um, you know, the streets would be over pouring because, and you know, it's not like it is now. There were there weren't as many things to do, um, and they were huge draws. And we actually sold a lot of you know important work and, and represented at the time. When I say represented, showed. Yeah. Uh, some wonderful artists and uh, over time. So that also added to the collective spirit of what was going on at LAI Works. That's so beautiful. So you were really putting an emphasis on the art object of the frame rather than the medical sort of clinical aspect or the kind of clinical feeling that eyewear had been previously, where you just kind of had like three choices I didn't live in that era, but I've heard stories where no, and yeah. you're, and you're saying it perfectly, Naomi. And the, and what's what's really interesting about that, and and you're seeing the nuance of it, is that while that was our intent, behind the scenes, we were total optical nerds. We loved the you know we loved that as the technology of it. We loved the medical side of it. We loved that fusion. And, and as, and we, you know, that we just loved it. You know, we were the, we would have, you know, we would like, you wanted to, you, you wanted to wear your, you know, your pocket protector with your PD ruler in it, like behind this, you know, that was us behind the scene because that's what we love. But we know we, so that was incredibly important to us that we were fusing those. Yeah. And another interesting point is it, it, in the beginning, uh, uh, we wanted to frame them so 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 purely as objects, as you know, as design objects, that we really um, kind of alienated the fashion crew. Okay. Not um, and and when I say that, I'm gonna I, when I say crew, really, what I mean is press. Um, <laughs> Because, but we, but what we, we allied ourselves and our, you know, and our allies were um, at the design press and they loved us because that we were framing something for them that they hadn't looked at. So we would be invited to like design conferences, Stanford, the conference on design at Stanford or a conference on design here or somewhere or somewhere or somewhere where we would be not invited so much to a fashion, uh, you know, oriented yeah. kind of event. And we were pleased, that was perfect for us. Perfect for us. Yeah, yeah, it's a good little, well, the eyewear, like glasses is really a utilitarian object. And so I find design is always serving the utility of the object. So it would make sense for me in a way. I almost like prefer that you kind of got into the design niche rather than the fashion niche. Um, mm -hmm. But I have a question about your customized eyewear because I know that at the very beginning, uh, you and Barbara were sort of drilling holes and melting frames. And um, so this is before that you, before you got LA Eyeworks, the eyewear brand, is, is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so when we first opened our store, we were, we were, you know, we were buying from the, from what was available. And at that time, what was available were a lot of, you know, drop temples, a lot of very big logo kind of, you know, branding. It was made through, you know, design, quote unquote, designer brands that had nothing to do with the authenticity of the designer. So you would see very big fashion house names with a great big logo on it that yeah. really had no relationship to the object itself. 
with few exceptions. I mean, there were some gorgeous things, and I don't want to frame it that way. But for the most part, it had become just a you know a, a, a cattle branding kind of situation, and that's that's what it was about. So, in the beginning, we uh, we we were buying what was available to us, and there wasn't much. And we decided to take the track of we would rather have for for from you know, from maybe one, we would find one frame from one company and we would buy it in black because that was the only, you know, that was the only one that looked, it just seemed to resonate the frame. Yeah. But we would then think, okay, well, what can, and we would buy a lot of them and we would sandblast one or we would drill one or we would put stones in one or we would do anything we could. And then we were always on the hunt for something that we could you know, turn into color. And so, uh, you know, we found some frames, we went into, um, uh, you know, vintage stock, if you will, from, you know, American manufacturers and found things that came in, always looking for something kind of in a neutral color that we could dye, that we could buy a lot of and that we could tint. So that kind of began for us. We found, uh, we found a frame uh, from uh, Chiron Continental, uh, it was called a Nooser. Uh, we found it in a color called Moonseed, which was the most really, it was, you know, how beige could something be? But it was a backdrop for for the most, it took dye in the most mm, incredible yeah. way. So we would dye it, do the same thing, sandblast dye, do that. Um, you know, and that kind of, that was a, a way that we could have, you know, things in our store that, because there was so really so little for us to buy that we were interested in. And we had, yeah, so that was, yeah, and we, so I'll say in the very beginning, we had made a challenge for ourselves to, we wouldn't buy anything with a logo on the outside. Yeah. That was, we wouldn't do it. And so that was also very limiting. Yeah. And eventually there was a first, a first design, a first drawing. Yeah. Yeah. And and, uh, I want to know if that's the beat, is it the beat frame? That was the first it design? The yeah. Yeah, it is the beat. You probably want to know what it looked like. Well, we're going to yeah. be superimposing <laughs> some images, I, I think. So we'll have, it, we'll have it showing here at some point. But so, you can describe what it looks like if no, you'd like. No, no, no. I thought, you were gonna, I thought maybe you were wondering if our drawings were like pristine, you know. Yes, um, I would love to yeah. know. Yeah. Well, it, well, please, they don't. They look, <laughs> I mean, I am the worst. Is, if there are a word called drawer in the world... Um, my drawings look like scratches. Uh, however, uh, in, in high school, I had taken a drafting class. I was the only girl in a, in a drafting class. And they, at that time, they were electives. Another word, I'm not sure. Yep, if, if we got that here too. Yep. <laughs> they were short. And so you got, you had two electives, you know, in a year, you know, so they lasted just a semester or a quarter or something like that, whatever it was called. And um, I loved it. Um, and, um, but it, I, but I was, um, <laughs> but so I learned, I learned how to make a drawing, you know, I, I learned how to make a basic mechanical drawing and truthfully, what I loved were the pencils. And, um, at the time the drafting tables were so fabulous and I loved graph paper and, you know, all the things that attracted me to, to, to it. So I did know how to make, I did know how to make a, a basic mechanical drawing. Yeah, um, I'm in no way. I am in no way an illustrator. I'm in no way, I, and nor is Barbara. Um, uh, you know, uh, we, we're not we're not artists of the drawn frame. But I'm wondering, um, maybe eventually, as the collection evolved, as you beca- you know, you had the beat, which was your first frame. But then after, subsequently, uh-huh. I'm sure you had other uh, designs Mm -hmm. as we are here, maybe what, 42 years later with Mm -hmm. LA Iwerks. Um, What comes first, the idea or the material or um, like, yeah, I, I guess my question, I guess my question is exactly that, but it's kind of in the broader term and I know it could be more fluid because there's all kinds of different designs, but um, yeah, like how do you work with that? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's such a nice um, it's such, it's nice to reflect on that, and sometimes it comes, you know, honestly, something can be. There have there are times when a frame is really built of color, you know, that you feel the you feel the intensity of 
some color and the color takes the form and shape of the frame. And there are other times when, you know, there's just a line you saw, you know, you saw a line or, or you were scribbling with your pencil and that line t- may, took the, you know, took the, took the cue and said, that's, that's what it's going to be. So it really can, it can come. And then, you know, and then the exploration, you know, by now we've been through the learning of, you know, I can say when we first, when titanium first came on the market, uh, or on the market, on the, you know, into the manufacturing, um, it was so exciting. So, you know, you just wanted to explore titanium when it came, when as, as new materials and new technologies come, those are exciting. And sometimes they lead you. And sometimes it's the challenge of a material that you just want to, you know, you just want to take something somewhere else. And I can say, or in a case of a frame, like the frame you're wearing, the XOX, sometimes you just want to solder something as many times as you can, or, you know, or you want to, you know, you're playing with early laser and you want to just, you know, you're trying to figure out how to apply it to eyewear. And those things now are all taken for granted, but you know, from from forty some years ago, we've gone through all of those sort of pushing each each time. Now, having said that, you know, our our interest in the technology has not has never been to say, okay, I want to make the lightest frame possible with this and this this. We've approached it from just pushing material and you know pushing it whether it's into a texture or into a shape or a form or you know, or a decoration, Um, you know, I'm not afraid of that word. Um, So those are, those are how materials interest, interest us. Yeah, I think that's really cool, because it kind of comes back to how you guys were experimenting with drills and sandblasting, and all that, it kind of sounds to me like you're using the technology that's coming into the eyewear industry as like a way to experiment, like, oh, we can do laser cutting now, like, what, what can we do? With that, and you brought up the XOX, which is what I'm wearing at the moment from 1991. Um, so yeah, that would be a good example to know. Like, did you think, oh, it would be so cute to have these XOXO, or did you have the the manufacturing abilities and say like, oh, well, given this ability, let's try to do something like this? Like, how did this specific frame come to be? Yes, well, the way the way that was an evolution. So before the XOX. You know, we had worked, we were using the, the idea of the, of the lens shape and the brow line separation. And we found it incredibly fascinating to use that space between the, you know, the eye. I'm not sure whether you're calling this. And some people call it an eye rim. Some people call it an eye wire. Our word is eye wire. That is the, the shape that holds the lens. So the shape that the eye wire and the brow separation said, oh, my God, look at this. There's all this room in here to explore. And so, and that came honestly from uh, looking at ironwork. You know, Los Angeles is, was it was full of um, wrought iron workers that you know, and they and then you'd always see their little sign on a fence, and it would say Martinez or Gonzalez or, you know, and and there would they would have a great little something that looked like a license plate, and they'd put it on their fence when they were finished, and they would everyone would have. And I started to look at them carefully, and everyone would have some little symbol of the of the iron work that they were doing and I thought oh man this is so cool I I this is I want to pay homage to this Los Angeles thing and so that's how it was really born and that was using that space between the brow piece and the eye wire as a place to explore you know this iron work of Los Angeles so in the beginning um there were frames like Carmen and Caruso Bolero and they were used you you could see the little work that was in there in between and it just continued um we used that space to talk about um freedom of choice uh, we've t- we used that space to make glasses for the statue of liberty to say to see love uh and then it just seemed time to just say xox we just need to this is an xox it's time to send the love out yes and i love it and in this in these times more than ever um, this frame is mo- so important to me. So I really thank you for it. Um, you said something incredibly lovely earlier, uh, Naomi, and that was that for right now with a mask, 
that particular frame was saying what you wanted to say without being able to express fully from the lower half of your face. And, and completely, I mean, see, I just got chills again saying that because that is what, that's what we think it's all about. I mean, I think we're trying to connect. So eyewear has such infinite possibilities in that. And it's like good, clean fun. (laughs) It's, you know, um, I, I have one more question about another specific frame, and then we can move on yeah. to other things. But I was really wondering about the, and this is by the request of several people, um, colleagues and, uh, yeah, colleagues and friends of mine who are also wondering about the uh, James Bondo, the oh. James Bondo <laughs> frame from back in the day. Um, oh. We're wondering, well, I always thought that that frame was interesting because it kind of evolved to the Bondo and the Bondito. I believe. Mm -hmm. And I always wondered how you came with the idea of those little notches. Cause that to me seems like something it's either like the chicken or the egg, like what came first, like the idea to make that or the sort of ability to fabricate. Well, it's so nice because I'm, I'm so happy that you see that and that you find interest. And that's why I love talking to you, Naomi. I, I just, <laughs> I so appreciate your curiosity and, and it's, uh, it's exuberant and it's uh, contagious. So thank you for those wonderful questions. Actually, the, um, the Bondo came first and the Bondo oh, okay. came, which was the bigger one. Yep. The Bondo came because prior to that, we'd made a, a series of frames that, There was, we wanted to minimize everything on the frame. And at the time, all of the rim locks, and I'm not, is that a word that you're, so all of the rim locks were hidden behind the uh, end piece. Right, yeah. Or, yeah, or they went, or you had a curved end piece and they went on to the edge of the end piece and they were all hidden in that way. And we, we, we had worked on a design that we really wanted to minimize all of that. And the only place to put the rim lock was on the, on the eye wire. And, and it was perfect. It was honest. It was right. And yet we took so much, you know, flack for it. Like everybody said, you can't put the rim lock on the rim. Yeah, of course we can, because there's no, I don't want to hide it. This is like, it's honest. I want to, and that was really the intention there. So not only that, but let's place that rim lock in a place that, you know, knocks the shape a little bit. And where would that be? Well, first time out, it was right about here, which takes, if you, if you put a rim lock down in that quadrant, you can throw off a round or a, a, you know, a P3 kind of shape in a really nice way. You take away the droopiness, you, you know, you, you just give something such a simple gesture. Or if you put it up top, you also can lift something up in a great way with just a little, it's just a little nod to knock that shape off a little bit. And so we were so pleased with putting our, putting our rim, putting our rim lock there is how it began. Well, so much flack, wonderful success on the frame to the community, but to the optical industry, it was just like, Oh my God, it was like, you know, you know, stuff of gossip. (laughs) And so, um, so in response to that, we said, you know what, this has been so good. This is so fun. We're just going to put those rim locks around the entire frame. And that's how it was born. And for an extra added treat, we put a rim lock inside the temple with an extra screw in it. And it was our little, you know, it it was our little screw you kind of thing. (laughs) But it was an extra screw. Wow. But and yeah, and and it was all in yeah. So and of course people people loved it. And that's how it really began. And they still love it so today. It's great. They love it. They love it today. And and Bondo, so we called it, you know, we called it Bondo. We was sort of in bondage. We had, you know, we put that we put that uh I we put that eye um rim what eye wire in bondage, you know, and then we yeah. called it Bondo. Yeah. And so as it evolved, as it evolved, it became, then we had to do the James Bondo, we had to do the Bondito, um, and that was just giving them, you know, taking them down, you know, really small and, uh, and playing with the shape. That is so awesome. I, I was like, I'd, I didn't want to have expectations about what the story would be, but that is like far better than anything I could have ever imagined. Like that is so awesome because it is true to your rebellious nature. I feel well, and the only, the really cool thing is 
that every one of those, and they, we used real uncut rim locks, and every one of those is soldered on. It's not like a notch and a cut on a machine. It was, it's actually a soldered on rim lock. So cool. And I mean, from what we've discussed so far, I can tell that you kind of, you fly by the seat of your pants, but you fly by the seat of your own pants. Like you're doing your own thing. I've mentioned a few times already in this, in this chat, but you guys are going on 40 something years of, of business. And I think that is just the most incredible thing, uh, especially in these times that things are a little bit more eph ephemeral. Um, and I want to tie this in with um, some, another passion of yours, which I have read and heard you talk about on a couple occasions, but, um, and a lot of LA eyewear wearers will already know that the temple tips of your frames are inspired by the Australian tree frog that has little like <laughs> nubs for, for yeah. fingers, for fingertips. So the little like, um, we'll have a, an image showing it, but it has little circular tip at the end. Um, so I know that the cold-blooded animals have been a very big theme in your life as you've already raised several <laughs> desert tortoises in your life. You can tell us how many. I would love to know. Mm, I think, I, <laughs> well, I've hatched in the, I've hatched uh, 23. Wow. Oh my gosh. 23 eggs and I had to stop. Because you're starting a it. farm. Well, yes, I, I now have I now have five. Okay. But those had we had to have to find homes yeah. for all those babies that hatched from eggs. Yeah. <laughs> that is so incredible. And I've heard you say before that um, when frogs shed their skin, it's kind of similar to when we put on a new piece of eyewear and we're sort of reinventing ourselves. So when the frog sheds their skin or snakes shed their skin as well, um, it's kind of like a, a reinvention of themselves. They're starting anew. And when we put on glasses, we feel anew. And I was wondering how um, the raising of tortoise, tortoises from, <laughs> from eggs has mm -hmm. influenced or shaped in any way the way that you have cared for LA Iwerks over all these years. Yeah, that's such, <laughs> I love your angles. It's so good. Um, yeah. I mean, I think, you know, the, for, I think it's this, you know, the, the, the tortoises um, go to sleep, you know, they sleep in the winter. Uh, it's called bruminating and it's just a deep, deep, quiet, and there, you know, it's just this side, the, the heartbeat slows down, everything slows down. It's just this side of hybrid, it's like a hibernation to a bear. Um, and, but there's a very deep breathing that you feel when that's happening. And it's just, you just, it's like ancient something. It's just ancient something. And you feel it. And, um, and when they wake up in the spring, you know, it's just like, oh, you just can't believe it. You know, you just you just cannot believe that that ancient feeling that's from that deep, um, you know, being has just woken up. So how does that relate to LAI works? I think it's just it's the cycles. You know, it's just that beauty and magnificence of life and how how you know how you relate it to the care for LAI works. I could only say that, you know, to, to, to take care of it, to yeah. take care of it, pay attention and that it, you know, it needs the time to do those kinds of things. And also we're incredibly persistent and we're incredibly optimistic. And, you know, so those kinds of things, I think that, you know, to wake up after, you know, four months of sleep is there's optimism in that. So yeah. I, I think for me, there's just a perfect relationship. Well, you've mentioned so. before that you, um, that you guys work a lot and that your, your, your personal life is your work life. Um, do you like your tortoises have some time to rest and recoup and replenish or is it pretty much go, go, go? Cause you are, you are saying that you're very persistent as well. Uh, no. So I have no time, no, no, no problem having fun. I mean, really? So no, 
there's always time for fun. And that can be, you know, it just doesn't, no, absolutely. It's, I mean, of course we work, 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 go, go, go. But um, no, you just, you have to, that time out for fun is just as important as it is for the, you know, the high power that you put in for the work. I, you know, I truly believe in that. And it's always been, and even if I've, even if I've not found a way to have a vacation for a long spell, I can find a way to have, you know, five concerts and, and, uh, you know, 16 dinners that with friends. So, you know, it's just just always time for fun. And I do check out, meaning in that fun, that's a check out. Yeah. Yeah. Fun, fun is full on. So that's, that's great advice for us all. And that finding that balance and being able to, to recoup and, and regenerate and, and re-inspire And so yeah, what, what would you, what would you attribute, um, the success over the years? Well, one thing is, you know, there's been, there's nothing like being in business with your best friend. I mean, that's just like, what? <laughs> <laughs> Even people could say that, you know, don't be in business with family. Don't be in business with friends. I have find that to be completely the antithesis of of anything. So there's that. And, um, I think just that, you know, we, it, it's the, that I would attribute the success to the fact that, you know, to our community, I mm. mean, you know, we've, they've given us so much. Um, we've learned so much. We've continued to learn so much from them and those, the interests grow deeper from them with them. And, um, you know, the ability to remain, you know, curious. I mean, that's been Barbara. Barbara, all, this is just her thing is, you know, be curious. Like, how can we, you know, be curious? You know, what is that? And I think I, I would give, I would attribute it to that, really. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, kind of like what you have in your backdrop there. That's sort of something to, like, consider consistently be discovering and and finding out more about and sort of keeping, keeping the ball rolling. That's really incredible. You know, Naomi, there's one more thing. And I think, uh, you know, I, I don't know if you and I have ever spoken about this or not, but I think also, you know, there's a, there's a point in everyone's career. If you're, if you're like, you know, rocketing or going slowly where it's so critical to not um, let your successes um, burden you. And if you if you are a person who needs to remain nimble, you know, success sometimes can bring a lot of challenges, huge, you know, so they can in lots of ways. I mean, they can bring pressure to perform. They can bring, you know, pressure to do it again better. You know, they can, you know, the monetary challenges the going bigger and bigger, that kind of thing. And so, you know, those, those came to us early. Like we knew let's, how can we, how can we not let this success like make us tighter and smaller in some way, that feeling of constraint to be expansive with your success in some way and to be, you know, humble in a way, humble. And I say, you be humble, but to have a feeling of humility about it so that there's a way that it's freeing and liberating instead of constraining. So that that if if I were in an advice kind of giving thing and I had a wizardly stick, I would just say, you know, let your successes be liberating, not tie you down. Wow. You know? So profound. Oh. <laughs> I just really heard that in a very profound way. So thank you so much. And that was a future question is advice. So that was perfect. Oh. Okay. Perfect. Um, and that's just a really great way to sort of like encapsulate the conversation. But there was actually some few things that I meant to mention at the beginning that I forgot to mention. But it's not even to mention. It's mo- mostly to give a context uh, to how we know each other, how we've met uh-huh. in the past. Yeah. And I think it's really cool and interesting, actually, because the first time we ever met, uh, you probably don't remember, but I'll... I'll tell the story is that we met at Vision Expo uh, two years ago. Yeah, two years ago, at Vision Expo East in New York. 
Um, and I was with my coordinator, Danielle Cloutier, and uh, one of our teachers, Julie Bécoté. And we walked up to you at the booth. And so what people might not know or they know very well is that you're often very upfront in the booth. You don't really hide at the back or sometimes when you're doing things, but most of the time you're upfront and saying hello to people. And I just sort of like ran up with uh, Danielle and Julie and was just like, let's go say hi to Gay. And we went up to say hi to you. And, you know, you talked to us about Montreal, which I was so surprised about because I don't know, you could have just not. And um, it was just really important to me because it's a, actually a trip that happens every year at our school that um, Danielle and the rest of the team puts together for the students. So along with this conference that we're putting out uh, this month is trying to invigorate um, our young opticians to discover new things and to discover eyewear, independent eyewear especially. So every year they have this trip where we can go to New York and go to Vision Expo and meet legends like you so oh. I, <laughs> I mean, really, uh, and then we've subsequently met later on, but, um, yeah, it was, it's just kind of like was a marker and that was like the beginning of my, my, my schooling career. So things have been going pretty fast since. And so, I mean, in, re in, in, in retrospect, things are just very chill, but I still feel like I'm going in an upward trajectory and what you've just said as advice earlier, like really, really hit home. So I really appreciate um, you and, and everything. And I really appreciate you taking the time. Um, I had like Naomi. some, yeah. No, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. And I guess I'd also like to know what can we expect this season, this year, next year with LA Eyeworks? Is there anything coming out? Are you guys working on anything at all? Well, we are. In fact, just on the drawing table, we're going to, we haven't, uh, we're about to, we're going to introduce a sunglass collection for the a capsule for the, oh. um, for the fall, well, actually spring 2022. Yes. Um, and we haven't, we haven't done a sunglass collection for a number of years. Um, it was just time to take a take a break. Um, so that's in the wings. Um, we and I'm really excited about it. Uh, so that'll that'll introduce uh, for in the late fall of 2021 for spring of 22. Uh, and we have. Um, <laughs> Um, well, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm most, most excited about the sunglass. Collection. Well, I'm actually curious now, how is it different designing sunglasses and it is designing ophthalmic glasses? Well, you know, for, for, uh, we've always approached our sun in the past, we've approached our sunglass collection as ophthalmic, you know, as, because we were designing for the optical industry right. and mostly our sunglasses were sold all, all in optical stores so you know we that's what led us to actually had a stop was that a lot of sunglass collections are designed for to be sold you know in department stores or boutiques or fashion stores and like that and we just kept our path straight going about uh, how we would do it and that was our market um so you know the so right now maybe you know i we're going back at it as as the um as as with the target to our optical customer yeah but also i think it opens up you know just this is there's more there's more freedom yeah um that you know i think this time around that i'm not so i'm not so concerned that it could be um you know that that it is rxable or not yeah. Um, if it is, it is great. If it isn't, that's okay. Where in the past, I was, you know, completely focused on the fact that it would need to be, uh, you know, suitable for an optical, you know, to, to make prescription lenses for. So that's liberating, um, you know, and that in a lot of ways for a lot of reasons. And I think, um, you know, also price becomes a, a factor. People, for if you to just, if you're looking at something that is not going to put, you're not going to put an RX in, perhaps it can't cost as much as, um, yeah. you know, something does um which is not necessarily there's not necessarily logic in it but if you're if you're not able to it may mean that it just should cost less you know yeah. because it was less expensive to make yeah uh, and so that 
would reflect that and that would be fine. And it's just opening that door and saying, okay, that's okay. If this works, then that's great. Then we can make it cost less as well. So, um, so you know, those are some of the considerations. That's so cool. And I have to say that in general with, with LA Iwerks, I, me and I've heard from other colleagues as well as the fact that you guys are opticians at the base of it. So you're optician first off, then designers, and the eyewear is always very thoughtful for uh, prescriptions. And that's thank like for saying. the ultimate. Yeah, thank you for saying. Well, that, I mean, you know, Barbara and I consider, we are opticians. That's where, we, that's where we're born. That's, what it, that's where it came from. So, um, yeah. Do you guys still practice today or less so? Um, well, uh, so, um, in fairness, <laughs> very occasionally, yeah. but, I, but I still, I've, I've got my chops. Yeah, um, sure. <laughs> you don't yeah. lose them that, that easily. Uh, no, the thing that you do that, that I am, that I am rusty on is, is, uh, just keeping, but I, I make it a point to, to, uh, keep as current as possible, uh, through my colleagues, but, and techno lens technology, yeah. you know, those are the, yeah. those beauties because boy you know there's such gorgeous um lenses available of course oh thank you so much gay i through this conversation i just keep having like radical humility coming through like i'm just hearing radical <laughs> humility so just thank yeah. you so much for imparting this on us um i know that we're Aww. we're a gang of us that are fans of yours and i think if i've Aww. learned anything it's just like staying Staying true to your curiosity, um, to your fun and rebellious nature, um, but also like keeping the integrity of the optical uh, and medical side of the industry as well. So it's a beautiful marriage yeah. of all those things. So I just really want to thank you so much. Thank you. It's really been my pleasure. Naomi, I, I did have one more thing. I, when you were saying that, um, I was just, I, I wanted to bring it up earlier also, but it seems uh, at the moment to, to resonate. And that seeing is a f like a full body experience. Yeah. You know, part of the conversation also, um, you know, when you're fitting lenses or you're fitting eyewear or fitting a frame, it's really about, you know, what are you doing in life? How do you use these? Are you, you know, are, are you, you know, how, how does it work for you? And um, so that's that that's that beauty of, you know, like you just can't look at yourself in a little hand mirror, stand up, you know, you need to walk around, you need to go outside, you need to see yourself in light, you need to know how you, you know, do, do you kiss with your glasses on, you know, what, what do you do when your glasses kind of some people do everything and other people, you know, just do it in small little fragments. So just in, in remembering that seeing is a is a whole body experience, you know, and uh, absolutely. And I think yeah. as us as opticians, um, we really end up getting into people's lives, right? Like we really yeah. end up getting yeah. uh, last semester, I was having a bit of issues with that, actually, because I had I was feeling bad asking people what they were doing in their day. And it was at mm. the clinic at school and uh, I had patients coming in and um, a lot of the patients coming in were, were older folks in the community that were coming in. And I was having a hard time asking them what they were doing in their day to day. And my teacher mm -hmm. was making it clear to me that we're only asking these questions, not because we're nosy, but because we really want right. to best serve them and offer them the best uh, products right. for them. And I right. just felt bad because I know that people are home maybe doing not much. You know, they're being isolated from their families. Uh, they're not going to their community centers the way they were before. And so I was having, uh, you know, a tough time with that. But I'm overcoming it. And I think it's a really a beautiful thing in the end because you end up having this really, uh, you know, whether you like it or not, you end up having like sort of a per personal and, and deep conversation about yeah. their day to day, but is so important because it's really their lives, right? Exactly. Yeah. 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 No, that, that, that's it. That's it. And uh, you know, yeah. And so on that note, also your intuition is, is, uh, you know, never, never put that to bed because, yeah. you know, your intuition is the guide and you'll know how deeply to go with your questioning. Yeah. But yes. An opportunity. And for those who are interested and, you know, that's an incredible thing that, you know, seeing is the whole, the whole, uh, body experience yeah yeah 
And we're ultimately like bettering people's lives with, with these beautiful yeah. pieces of, of artwork on our face, right? So in the end, it's a win-win for everybody. I feel it. <laughs> yes. Uh, this was so good. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Naomi. Yeah. <laughs> it's a wrap. <laughs> Bien, alors, euh, ben, bravo, Naomi. Merci. Alors, on aura la suite la semaine prochaine parce que oui. je vous invite à être au rendez-vous la semaine prochaine. Il y aura Medigora de VM L'Atelier qui sera avec nous. Et euh, ben, puisque Nathalie, euh, Naomi, pardon, nous a, vous a, a fait allusion à Zaha, qui est sa, sa création, eh bien, on en parlera un peu plus en profondeur la semaine dernière avec euh, Medigora qui... Euh, Qu'est-ce que j'ai dit la semaine dernière? Et mon Dieu! La semaine prochaine, euh, qui, euh, à la fin de sa conférence, fera, portera un, vous, vous, vous parlera du processus en collaboration avec Naomi. Alors, c'est un rendez-vous pour la semaine prochaine. Je vous remercie grandement d'avoir été là. Merci, Naomi. Merci. Ciao. Merci tout le monde.